In the last two lessons, first we talked about the biblical definition of not working on Shabbos. Creative work, no creative work. That's what we discussed in the first class, first lesson. And then we discussed two things that were added to Shabbat later. The first was by Shlomo Melech, which is the Erev. And the Erev we explained is a place that from the Torah is not a public domain, right? In order to be a public domain, it's a certain kind of public domain. But there are some places that are shared spaces, like a yard that's shared by a bunch of homes. Because they're shared, it looks like a public place. So the only way to carry is if you make an Erev. That's what Shlomo Melech did, right? A barrier to close it off. Right, but if it's open, it gets a different type of thing. It becomes a caramelist, it becomes a bigger problem. They have to close it in, and then they share bread. And by sharing bread, they make themselves all, like they make their shared space into like one house. You can do it once for a long time, actually. I don't, uh, maximum, I don't think so. Actually, I remember I was in, um, in Yerushalayim, I went to the Big Belza Synagogue. You guys ever been to Yerushalayim? So you visited the Belza Shul? Bells, it's the Hasidim the Hasid of Bells. It's in, the, it's in the bottom of the hill of Jerusalem. It's outside of, like, far from the old city. There's a massive, massive, massive synagogue with 10,000 people in there, probably. It's huge. And in the back there, they have, like, a matzah there. That's the, the Eidov. I think they renew it every year or something. I think. I'm not, mis- I'm not mistaken. It's the Eidov for their community. Sorry? Yerushalayim has walls. The old city of Yerushalayim has walls, yeah. They can do it. I'm sure, maybe, I don't know exactly how they do it in Yerushalayim, but they do something in Yerushalayim. Anyways, this came from Shlomo Melech. That was the one new element of Shabbat. The next new element of Shabbat came from Yeshaya the prophet, and he added, sorry, Yem Tashiv and Shabbat Lecha, and there he said, and our sages explain what does he mean when he says that? To rest, not to speak business on Shabbat. Not to speak about something you're not supposed to do on Shabbat. So now it's not just a question about doing work on Shabbat, but not even talking about. It. Now we're going to get to what people call muktza. What does the word muktza mean? Literally, translate the word muktza. Muktza means it's set aside. It's set aside. In halacha, they really call this this set of halacha, they call it iser tiltul, which means the prohibition to move something. The iser of moving something. Now, we call it muktza because muktza means, you can look on page seven in the, in the uh, thing there. Muktza means something that is set aside. Are you on the first, uh, yeah, the first uh, section, first piece of the Gemara there on top of page seven. Muktza means something set aside. What that means is something which is set aside that I can't use on Shabbos, then I shouldn't even move it. That's what it is. Oh. Now, there are different levels of why something is set aside on Shabbat. So, for example, when Shabbat starts, there are candlesticks on my Shabbat table, right? Now, those candlesticks are actually burning right now because it's the beginning of Shabbat. And if I move them, what would happen? I make the oil move around the clip. And that is not a, that's a biblical creative work, prohibition for sure. So the moment Shabbat started, those candles were muktza. They were set aside. I cannot touch this on Shabbat. So that's something I can never touch on Shabbos. But then there is, for example, something, let's say, uh, I, I sell plates for a living. Now, pl- is a plate muktza on Shabbat? I can use plates on Shabbat. I use them to eat, right? But these plates are in my warehouse. So what do I have them for? In my mind, what are those plates for? For me to use? The plates in my warehouse for my store. What are they for? To sell. For my business, to work. So they are muksa. They are set aside in my mind that I'm not going to use those on Shabbos. On Shabbos. That we can't do because that we learned, we learned uh, last time you can't talk about business on Shabbat. But now we're learning that you can't even use those plates on Shabbat because those, those plates are muksa. Those plates are set aside for business. So anything on, that's set aside to not be used on Shabbat I can't use on Shabbat. 
but they're different levels. That's a big question. Am I allowed to or not? It's a very good question. Generally speaking, the answer is no. Because these are items that I plan on selling, which means it's muktzah. In my mind, it's set aside, not for Shabbat use. I can't use on Shabbat, Shabbos. That's essentially what, what muktzah is. Anything that I cannot use on Shabbat, because it's set aside, I'm not allowed to move it. That's, the, that's the, what muktzah really means. But there are different levels. Why is it usr? Is it usr? Be, is it, why is it muktzah? Why is it set aside? It's set aside like an iPhone, because the iPhone, I can't use because it's electric and I can't use it. But there are times when I could use my iPhone on Shabbat. For example, if there's an emergency, I'm going to call 911. Oh, so it's not, but uh, let's say a stone, a, pe a stick on the, ground, on the ground. Is there ever a reason why we need to use it on Shabbat? No? That's also muktzah, but different kind of muktzah. So I need the place. So in that case, I'm allowed to move it because I need the place. So I can't use it if I need it because it is something that I'm allowed to use on Shabbat. But if I need the place, I'm allowed to move it. So you have to be careful not to do that. You have to be very, very careful not to do that. But let's just assume you're not going to turn it on. So there's different types of muktzah depending on why it was set aside. Remember, like, like for example, the art hanging on my wall. There's no like isser there, but it's something that I know I'm not going to use. It's like, it's like that stuff that I'm going to sell for business, it's put aside, it's muktza, it's put aside, I'm not using the Shabbat. Same thing with the clock on my wall, I'm not using it on Shabbat, it always stays there, I never take it down. So pencil again, because it's something that I'm not supposed to use. It's set aside. When Shabbat starts, I know I'm not using my pencil because it's, because it's, its primary use is for something that's forbidden. Another example, a hammer, right? A hammer is something that's set aside, not for use on Shabbat because it's meant to bang in nails and you don't bang in nails on Shabbat. What if I wanted to use my hammer to uh, crack open it to, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know, to crack a coconut to eat? I'm allowed to use not allowed to use it. These are big questions, but it all comes down to how and why is this thing set aside for no use on Shabbat? Okay, clear? So now let's see when did this start. Now here comes the story of King David. You know the story. King David asked Hashem, you want to know when's he, when he's going to pass away. And Hashem told him, I'm sorry, but the rule is I don't tell people when they're going to pass away. And he begged him, begged him. So finally Hashem said, okay, I'm going to tell you what day of the week you're going to pass away, but not which one. It's going to be Shabbat. Which Shabbat? You have no idea. But any Shabbat you should know, be ready. You're, going to, you're probably going to die. So what did King David do? Now you have it over here. This is in the top of the page. That's right. Shabbat, Lamed on the base. Let's see the Gemara inside. Top page seven. This comes from Mesech the Shabbos, the Gemara and Shabbos. Page 30B. Only Shabbos. That's what Hashem told him. Hashem so let's see. Call Yom of the Shabbat. Every day that was Shabbos. Have a Yosef, David, and Melech would sit. The goddess. And he would learn. Kula Yom. All day long. Because if he's learning. The Malach HaMavis can't get him. The Malach HaMavis. The angel of death can't kill someone. In the middle of doing a mitzvah. He would non-stop. His mouth did not stop from learning. From the beginning of Shabbat. To the end of Shabbat. He was up awake the whole time. Either maybe, maybe he stopped to do a mitzvah, because when you're doing a mitzvah, you also can't get killed by a malachim of it, but he would not, his mouth would not stop moving from staying Torah. Now, how who you that Shabbat, that day, the boy of the that he was supposed to pass away. Come malachim of us, so the angel of death shows up, Kameh before King David, he wants to do his job, take King David, make him pass away, because that's, 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 this is the day that Shem said he's supposed to die. And the malachim of wasn't able to get him. The loy have a pasik pum begirsa because his mouth did not stop from moving. Omar, so the angel of death said, My Abedle, what am I going to do with this guy? He's studying all day long. I'm supposed to, God sent me on a mission to go to kill this guy, David. <laughs> I'm using the wrong word to kill, to make David pass away. And he's not letting me because he's busy studying all day long. What am I supposed to do? So the Gemara says, Havulo, uh, I think he pronounced the word as Bustana. King David had a garden, a chorde besa, behind his house. So the, the angel of death arrived, right? Right? Sorry? Yeah, let's see the story. So the, the angel of death comes, Salah goes to the back of the house, and climbed up a tree. 
and he started shaking it. Nothak, so King David went out, Lemechze, to see what was going on. Why is this tree shaking so violently? Have, what? That's right. Have a solid padarga. He was walking down the steps. If his darga, and one of the steps opened up, metutif mandrim, ishtik. For one second, he stopped studying Torah because he's walking the whole time to go see studying Torah nonstop. Stepping on a step, step opens up, he falls in, and his mouth stops. Stop. For one second, he stops learning Torah, but noch nafsha, and he passed away right there. Yeah, just that's it. So now, King David passed away. What does that have to do with Muktza? Let's see. Is it, is it, Hashem sent them on a mission. Right. Hashem sent them on a mission. You have to make them pass away. So Muhammad is looking around like, oh, how, how do I do this? This guy's learning all day long. I can't do anything. So this whole plan. Made the tree shake outside. King David comes outside, trips on a step. Because oh. it's the time for his, it's his time. Hashem gives everybody their time. And his time was up. It's a whole story where King David got 70 years. Right? It took some years from Adam Arishon, who's supposed to live longer, but Adam Arishon lived a little less and gave his years to King David. It's a whole other story, right? But this is the bottom line. So how does, what does that have to do with Muktza on Shabbat? So he passed away. Now a body, remember, what's the definition of Muktza? The definition of Muktza is something that I have no use for on Shabbat. In my mind, it's set aside that I have no use for on Shabbat. Do you have any use for a dead body on Shabbat? Absolutely no. Could you bury it on Shabbat? No, you can't. So you have no use for it. It's, actual, it's absolute Muktza, right? So what do you do with the dead body on Shabbat? But so if the person passed away before Shabbat and you have to leave it till after Shabbat, okay, so they put it into a morgue, into a freezer. Sorry? But he passed away during Shabbat. What do you do? His body's lying on the floor at the bottom of the steps there. He's, it's not the Kulach Nefesh. He's already passed. The Kulach Nefesh means to save a life. His past is left. It, but it's not respectful, right? It's not respectful to... to, to... Exactly. So, so, Shalach Shleim Alabim Adrasha, Shalom Amalach, and David's son sends a message to, this, to the Beis Medrash, to where the Chachamim are learning. He wants to know what the halacha is. Abba Meis, my father passed away, umuto b'chama, and he's lying in the sun. The klodim shabet Abba, and the dogs in my father's house, the avim, are hungry. Meaning to say, if I leave him there, it's disrespectful. But, ma esa, what should I do? But it's Muktza. I can't move this, dead, this, this body. No, the Eruv comes later, right? But the, right, Muktza has nothing to do with carrying outside the house. Nothing to do with Eruv. It's I'm not allowed to touch things. Right? I'm not allowed to carry things that I have no use for in Shabbat. This is a body I have no use for in Shabbat. I can't carry it, even in my own house. Right? Muktza is even in your own house. You can't carry the phone even in your own house. You can't move it. Right? So I can't move the body. It's Muktza. There's no use for it. But it's lying there. It's disrespectful. And there's dogs coming. So Ma'asa, what should I do? So he asked the question. What does a Jew do when he doesn't know the answer? He asked the Shaila. He goes ask the question from the rabbis. What's the halacha, right? So Shalom HaMalach asked the Chachamim in the Beit Medrash, what's the halacha? Oh, so he said, they told him like this. Shol Chulei. So they sent a message back to him. Chatoich Nevela. Take a piece of meat from your house. Vahanach lefnei haklavim. And give it to the dogs. Let your dogs eat other food. Make sure that, first of all, make sure the dogs don't touch your father. Feed them, number one. Now, Vavicha, what about your father? Hanachalav kikar aitinik. Put on top of him a loaf of bread or a little child. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Or put, put a little child or a loaf of bread. Those are your two options. The tiltla, then you can carry him. How does it help? How does putting a. Because you're, uh, you're technically carrying the bread, which means like this. This is an halacha. It's called a basis. A basis means a foundation. So, for example, is a table mukta? No, because it's something I have used for on Shabbat, right? But what if I put my candlesticks on it? Now, this table is a foundation for what? Yeah. Candlesticks. So, if the candlesticks are not are mukta, then anything that's holding up the candlesticks are also yeah. mukta. Now, what if? It's not a foundation for the candlesticks for something that's moksa, but I put a candlesticks and I have a siddur. Now, this is a foundation not just for the candlesticks, but also for the siddur. Now, I couldn't move it, which is why on your Shabbat table, 
when you, before Shabbat starts, you don't just have your candlestick, you should put something on it. You put the challah there, you put the bottle of wine there, or you put your, your Bechat Amazon there, like the, the Berkon, like the, the, um, the booklet for the Kiddush and for the Bechat Amazon. So that way, the table is not just a foundation for the candlesticks, then you wouldn't be able to move the table or the tablecloth. But if you put other things in it, now you could. So now they said like this, put the piece of bread, loaf of bread on your father. Now your father is a foundation for the loaf of bread and the loaf of bread is not muktzah. And that way you can carry him out. Because you know, you're not carrying out the body, you're technically carrying out the loaf of bread. But you should know, just for the halacha, the halacha is, you can't do this anytime you want. In other words, I can't take a loaf of bread, put it onto my iPhone and start moving my iPhone. You're only allowed to do it when there's a question of disrespecting a, a dead body. Then you're allowed to do it. But what does the story show you? That when did the halacha of muktzah start? At least before King David. So according to the story, the law of muktzah began even before Eruv. Not in the Torah, because the Torah doesn't say anything about, about it, but certainly before King David. Right? So in this, from this story, it would mean that Muktzah, the laws of Muktzah came before the laws of Eruv, because Eruv started when Shlomo Melech was king. And this starts before. Now you're going to ask me, how come, not, how come I put it in this order? Why didn't I put it before? Right? I was going in order of, so let's see the next text. Uh, the, the last word in line, tough is Tanrabonon. This is also in the Gemara and Shabbos, page Kufchav Gimel on the base, 123 side B. And it says like this, our sages taught, Barishana, to begin with, how you they used to say, You're only allowed to touch three types of things on Shabbos. Anything else, you cannot move. They took Muktza so extreme at this time in history, so extreme to the point that you're only allowed to pick up three things. What are they? Mitzu or Sheldvela, a kind of pot or kind of like a dish that they used to make a certain kind of pie. Dvela is like a, I think it's a pie made of figs. Vizuama listed in Shokadera. And you're allowed to get, uh, there's a certain kind of ladle that cleans out your pot. The Sakn Tana Shalgabe Shokhan and the knife that you use at your table. So there was a certain time when you were not allowed to touch anything on Shabbat, Shabbos, except for these three things, basically things you absolutely need to survive, things you need to eat. You have to have your pot so you can make your, you can serve your dishes. You have to have the ladle so you can serve soup and you have to have a knife so you can cut your bread and eat, and eat like a, eat on the table. Anything else? No touching. Don't touch the book. Don't touch the table. Not a chair. Nothing. Only these things you need to eat. Right? Now, sorry? The, the, that you're allowed to. Basically, anything you need to absolutely eat. You're not, you're not drinking, you're just carrying it around the house? Yeah. You can't carry still. So one second, remember, there were those two things here. Muktza is not about carrying outside of your house. Muktza is even in your house, right? So, this, so we have one story which tells us that King Dave, Shlomo Melech, wasn't going to carry his father because it's muktzah, right? Even in his own house. Now, another story is telling us that some other time in history, we'll see when this is in a moment, you weren't allowed to touch anything, nothing, except for things you needed to eat. These three things the Gemara says here, that you absolutely need to eat, right? Now, hitiru, v'chazer v'hitiru, they said, okay, you know, you're allowed, to, you're allowed to carry this. Now you're allowed to touch, not carry, I'm sorry, you're allowed to move this inside your house. This is not muktzah. That's not muktzah. That's not muktzah. They kept on being more and more lenient until they said, any utensils. You're allowed to touch on Shabbat, with the exception of a big saw, because you never need a big saw on Shabbat, and the big iron you use to cut the grass. Those are two things you're never going to need on Shabbat. Okay, so when did this happen? So let's see. What? Close, almost. Look at the next page, top page eight. This is, oh, I don't have the page of the Gemara. I think it's the exact same. Yeah, same page. The Gemara says, Amar Rabbi Chanina, Rabbi Chanina says, Bimei Nechemya ben Chakloya Nishnes Mishnes Nu. This came in the times of Nechemya. Who is Nechemya? One of the prophets. Where does he live? When does he live? At the, after Purim. At the beginning of the second temple. Same time as Ezra and Daniel. Way after David Melech. This is a contradiction. First, we said that, that Muktzah was a problem in the time of David Melech. 
And now we're saying that when did Muktza happen? By Nehemiah. And Nehemiah said, you can't touch anything. And then they said, okay, you can touch this, touch this, touch this. And finally they said, you can touch everything except for two things. The, 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 the thing you cut your grass with and the big saw. So when did Muktza happen? Before King David or by Nehemiah? The Tanaim? The Mishnah comes way after. The Mishnah comes after the second temple. Right, just, do the, just do the order quickly. You have Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeshua goes to the land of Eretz Yisrael. You have Shoftim. Right? And then you have King Shaul. David. Shlomo Melech. Shlomo Melech builds the first base of Midash. That stands for 400 years. You have a bunch of kings. And you have the two split kingdoms, right? North and the south. The north that's kicked out. That's the lost 10 tribes. Right? First base of Midash is destroyed. Jews go to Persia. That's when Purim happens. And then with Ezra and Nehemiah and Daniel, they come back to, Rush- to Eretz Yisrael, build the second temple. That stands for 400 years. During those 400 years in the middle, you have Hanukkah. After Hanukkah, you have Hillel, Shammai, Shmai, Aftalion, Gamliel, and all those Tanaim. And then after the second, then towards the end, by Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai, the second base Middash is destroyed. You still have more Tanaim after Rabbi Yochanan and Zakkai, Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Huda, and then the Mishnah is written. After the Mishnah is written, Jews mostly end up in Bavel. Some are still in Yishalayim, and that's when the Gemara is written. After the Gemara, you have the Ga'onim, and after the Ga'onim, then you have Jews going to Sfarad and to Ashkenaz. And then you have the Rishonim, Achronim, and now we are here today. Okay, that's, that's, that's the timeline. Right? So King David is at the beginning of the first temple, before even the first temple. And Nehemiah is at the beginning of the second temple, something like 500 years later. So which one? When is it? When did it start? But the Gemara is saying that he was the one that came up with the idea. He was the one that came up with the idea, or at least it was his time, it was his people, who said, no, no he, they started Mukta, no touching anything. And then they slowly let you do more and more and more. So let, let's see how we can get to the answer to this question. What? No, it's talking about Mukta within the house. In the house. It was only in the house. Just to take it to a private room where he's not going to be touched by the dogs, right? Until Sunday, they buried him. And if, only if there's a few houses in one courtyard. But this is a private house. What? King David, King David had hot dogs in his house. It's an old thing, you know. Kings have hot dogs, have animals. It's part of the glory of the king. Sorry? All right? Okay, so let's see. So let's try to understand what this is. Let's see now. This is from the Shulchan Aruch written by the Alter Rebbe, by the first Chabad Rebbe, who wrote a Shulchan Aruch, the same person who wrote the Tanya. Okay, let's finish up quickly, and then we'll let you go. So let's see. On page uh, eight, the second text there. Avol shaloy l'tzorich klal, but if you don't need something, aser l'tal t'leshum kli, you can't move anything. If you don't need something, don't touch it on Shabbat. As I said before, what's mukta? Mukta is something I don't need. Some, I don't need it. If I don't need it, I don't touch it on Shabbat. That's what mukta is, right? That's what we explained before. Unnecessary. Mukta means it's put aside. It's unnecessary. No touching it. Even if this is a kind of keli, even if it's a kind of utensil, which I'm allowed to use on Shabbat, a cup. Why? The fish should be main nechemia bechakloya. Because at the time of nechemia, before the second temple of Bedash, at that time, People were not taking Shabbat seriously. Ah, so let's see. So what did Nehemiah do? What did Nehemiah say? Nehemiah said, even something that's permissible on Shabbat? Hmm? He was, because people were not taking Shabbat seriously. So Nehemiah made a fence around Torah and said, even something you need on Shabbat, no touching. But then he slowly started saying, okay, you're allowed to if you need it. If you need it, you're allowed to. First, he said, don't touch anything unless you need it, even if, you're, even if it's something which is permissible. But then, like the Gemara said, they started becoming more and more lenient until finally they said, okay, but you can't touch the big sword and the thing you cut your grass with. Okay, so that's one part of Muktzah. But now go to the end. We're skipping a little bit here. The last line of uh, the middle text. You see it? The, the last line there. Avo. Dover she'ene rebe Shabbat. Something that's not has no use for on Shabbat, Haya Asla Taltal was forbid was forbidden to move. It was Muktza 
after you made Dovah even in the time of Dovah Shlema, of Oi Kaidim Lachem, or even earlier. So let's see. There are two parts to Muksa. One part of Muksa is something you have no use for on Shabbat. Something you have no use for Shabbat that was always usher way back when, like a dead body, like sticks and stones in the yard. Something you have absolutely no use for on Shabbat that was, that was forbidden even before King David, which is why when he passed away, he wasn't allowed to. But what did Nechemia add? Nechemia added that even something you're allowed to move on Shabbat, if you have no use for it, don't do it. So there's two parts to Muqtza. That's what we're learning today here. Two parts to Muqtza, which come at two different times in history. That's correct. Initially, so let's go through now the, the process of how Shabbat started. Biblically speaking, only creative work is forbidden. Sometime before King David, we don't know when, but sometime before King David, they made a rule, if you don't need that thing, if, you have, if, you have, if this is something which you have no use for on Shabbat, don't move it. What's the reason for that? You know what the reason is? This is, this is something that the, uh, I think this is, comes from the Rambam. I don't remember exactly, but this is the language. The, the, language. the reason is like this. If we only let, if we only did what the Torah said, which is no creative work, and someone decided, oh, it's Saturday, it's Shabbat, I want to move my furniture around. She starts rearranging his whole house. Did he violate any of the biblical laws? No creative work, didn't violate. But did he rest on Shabbat? Yeah, but he didn't violate any of the malachas. Right? So he just moved things around in his house. Right? So he didn't violate the Torah rule, but Torah wants him to rest on Shabbat. And did he rest? No. So the Chacham said, okay, we can't do this. We can't just have, okay, I didn't do any creative work, but the whole time he's working on Shabbat. So the Chacham said, okay, if you have no use for that on Shabbat, stop moving it. That came right before by King David time. And therefore, a dead body you couldn't move. And that's why Shlomo Melech had to ask the halacha from the Bet Medrash. Then later comes Yeshaya the Pro, comes Shlomo Melech, and he adds, Eruv, comes later Yeshaya the prophet, and he adds, no talking about business on Shabbat. And then comes Nechemia and says, even something you're allowed to move on Shabbat, but if you have no reason, don't. Now we're seeing how Shabbat starting to get more and more look like our Shabbat. And we still have um, two more things that are added on Shabbat, and I put them at the end because I don't know when they started. The Gemara, I couldn't find the source for when they actually started. All the other things now, I t- I, we saw who did it. It was either before King David, or it was Shalom Melech himself, or it was Yeshaya the prophet, or it was Nechemia the prophet. So we knew when they were, so I put it in order. But there's two more items that are forbidden on Shabbat, which we'll get to God willing on Monday. And those two things, I have no date for, so I put them at the end. So I don't know when they came. No. Eight of only meanings in times of Moshe Rabbeinu, right? The, we saw from this smug who wrote that before Shalom Melech, they were, busy, they were busy fighting battles. And when you're busy fighting battles, you don't have to have an Erev to carry in camp, right? So it only started by Shalom Melech, which means before Shalom Melech, in times of Moshe Rabbeinu, when they were in, when they were in, let's say, in the desert, either there was a, either there was a, a biblical public, public domain or a private domain. And if it was a shared public area, they were allowed to carry there. They didn't need an Erev. Shlomo Melech added a need for a native. That's where we learned that carrying is forbidden on Shabbat. Right? The, the prohibitions from Shabbat, the malacha from Shabbat, comes from the malacha of the Mishkan. And the Mishkan had to carry, which is why it's forbidden to carry on Shabbat. For, to build the Mishkan, you're not allowed to break Shabbat, but to work in the Mishkan, you're allowed to. Right? Is that clear? Kabbalah, you have to bring Kabbalah on Shabbat. It's a mitzvah. Right? Clear? Okay. Have a wonderful Shabbat, and God willing, we'll continue on Monday.